Hello and welcome everyone to this week's potentialization interviews. Um, just as a reminder, uh, this session is being recorded. Um, all of our videos are going to be put on our YouTube channel um, and you can always go there to look at previous weeks as well. So um, welcome everyone for joining and um, this week um, we're going to be doing a uh, interview with Sheila Cook, and I think she's going to do a bit of drawing as well, which is great. And um, then we'll be having a Q&A afterwards. So, um, and the topic of this week's talk is healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people, which sounds absolutely brilliant, and I'm dying to know more. So, hello, Sheila. Hi, Phil. It's good to be with you tonight. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. And um, yeah, could you just start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Um, well, you can tell, first of all, by my accent that I'm not from around here. Um, I'm from a place called Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota in America. Um, and I'm married to Christopher Cook, who's on this call as well. And uh, he's the reason that I live in the UK. I have an MBA and a degree in sociology and anthropology, which doesn't sound very likely for what I'm doing right now, which is I'm educating farmers in holistic management. And I have never been a farmer. Um, however, I'm really enjoying my work with farmers. It, it's, I would have to say it's the most meaningful uh, job that I've ever had. Wonderful. That sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, and it's always good to do meaningful things uh, because then like as well, you know, when we're really in alignment with the service that we're delivering and it's all meaningful, then, then it just flows a lot better, which is absolutely brilliant. So, um, so to start a few questions, if, if we um, regenerate, um, sorry, if we regenerate soil, what is possible? Yeah. It's probably important to say, what do we mean by regenerating soil? And point. we'll start there and then, then let's get the second half of the question. And so regeneration of soil, um, you can look at it through a lot of different lenses, but how, how we look at it is through the lens of the ecosystem. And today our soil is is terribly degraded. And we, can, we see this all the time in the news. Um, one example of how our soil is degraded is that um, soil doesn't hold water very well. And in the UK, where we get a lot of water, um, and the, if the water is just running off the soil, um, that's leading to all kinds of downstream problems you know, floods for one thing. And then because the soil isn't soaking up the water very well, and we see this in our tests, then when we do have a drought, which for us means like no rain for about two weeks, farmers suffer because they, they don't have water for their plants. So degraded soil comes in lots of guises, but in a UK context, it's kind of all about water. Knock on effects of it though, is that the soil isn't functioning very well but from a mineral cycle. And so the food produced in degraded soil is lacking in nutrition. And that's where humans are getting our nutrition from is the food coming out of our soil. So if the soil isn't functioning well to begin with, we are receiving poor nutrition. And then, of course, there's many knock-on effects of that. Um, you know, our human health, our longevity, um, our ability to emerge as humans is all impacted um, by the food that we imbibe. Just our energy level, our attitude towards life is all impacted by, you know, the quality of the food that we're eating. And so then what's possible if we regenerate soil, I think we can make heaven on earth is the simple answer to the question. I think that so many wicked problems can be turned around. And so there's another 
phrase, what do I mean by a wicked problem? That's, that's a real phrase, and it refers to the really complex problems that we face as humans today. Wicked problems tend to be um, contradictory. The solutions are costly. They're difficult to define. The issues are really interconnected. A solution can cause new problems, and a solution can't be tested without just plain old implementing it. And we've got loads of uh, wicked problems today. Climate change, human health, skyrocketing healthcare costs. Um, pandemic is an example of um, a wicked problem that we're facing today. Wow, oh, it's fascinating actually, because one of the things, because I live in Manchester and I, and it always seems to be raining here, and one of the things I've always thought is, well, at least we're getting loads of water in the soil and the soil and the plants and everything are going to be happy, but it sounds like possibly not if it's all running straight through from the poor quality of the soil. Um, I hadn't, I've never have thought of that, basically. So I wouldn't have done either. But we, we do um, what's called ecological outcome verification. So we're verifying that mm. a farmer's practice is actually regenerating soil. And one of the things that we do that I think is very telling is a water infiltration test. And um, our average score in 2020 was that farmers were infiltrating less than one inch of rain per, per one hour. Now, that's not that much rain. And yeah. what it means is we're losing, we're losing rain. And what happens there is it generally is taking soil with it. And you're probably wondering, why is this a problem? I mean, what's causing it? And it's our, basically, it's our industrial agriculture is leading to this problem. And there's multiple things that we're doing in how we farm today that's making this problem happen. And because 70% of our land in the UK is agricultural land, it's a huge problem. And the soil, we find our soil as far as away as Denmark. And it takes a long time to make soil. So we don't really wanna be losing soil to Denmark. No, no, definitely not. And it's, 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 it's interesting. There seems to be, you know, multiple facets to this problem, like you're saying. But also, you, you hear a lot of different things um, when it comes to food, where to get food from, sustainable, sustainability, etc. Um, and loads of um, scientific theories on various different things. So a kind of a question is, who do you know what to believe on these things? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And First, I think I just want to tell you like my own journey through this uh, because it is confusing as a consumer to know who to believe and, and what to believe. Mm -hmm. And I did not start caring about what I was eating until I was in my uh, late 30s. And what happened that, and now I'm 59, so that was quite a long time ago, but still that's quite old to just, just all of a sudden wake up and think about mm, what I'm eating matters. There were a couple things that happened that made me care about it. One, the key thing is I was living in Japan. And uh, at the time, um, there were repeated food scares that were big in the media. One was milk, one was related to beef. And at the same time in the UK, we had a, a big problem and it was making global headlines. And um, a couple of things happened that were like direct for me. One was I was on an airplane ride from Tokyo to Los Angeles and sitting next to this woman who like t spent a very long time telling me how her best friend in Michigan had died from mad cow disease. And she told me how she died and what a horrible death it was and blah, blah, blah. Now, the thing was, we were told at the time that that didn't exist in America. And 
I said, well, then how did she get it? And she said, oh, the doctors blamed it on the fact that she had been in the UK 10 years prior. God. Now, I think we can all safely say here, she didn't get mad cow disease from being in the UK 10 years prior. Yeah. And it was very clear from what she described, the suffering of her friend, that she had it. And so that was a shocking experience for me on that plane ride to understand that it's very likely that my own government is telling lies to me. And I learned in Japan, the government also told lies there and tried to cover up a lot of these food scares. Then the next thing that happened was I was asked to go back to America, but in the short term, I still needed to be in Japan, and I ended up staying in a missionary's house um, while my family moved back to America. And they had book after book after book on health related to food, and I started reading these books. And I learned loads about how our health is really impacted by what we eat. And so this was a great big wake up call for me um, in terms of becoming aware that it really matters what you eat. Um, and it was not very long thereafter that I decided to become vegetarian because the food scares in Japan were all related to animal products. And I decided after reading all these books animal products were not very safe to eat. And not long after that, I actually went vegan. And the reason I went vegan was because I wanted to help our planet. And I thought that um, being vegan would help with climate change. And it wasn't until much, much, much later that I found that was not true. But it, it was a journey. And so I look at back at that time as my wake up call. And um, then I've, I've changed what I eat many times since. Every time I learn more, then uh, it impacts me and I really do change what I eat. And I've, I've made more changes recently. But so how I look at it now is that all of us, need to take responsibility for learning about food and we need to make the best decisions for ourselves and um, i think it's a thing that we need to be like constantly learning about and adapting what we eat as we learn more absolutely fascinating and uh yeah you're right it's all it's always good to learn more and it's always good to learn and grow and like you know your body is um your machine to to get you through this life and this world so you want to feed it well and i tell you what i am definitely listening to you because um you know if if, if you really are 59 you're looking absolutely fabulous so uh, I'm, I'm definitely following any guidance you've got on healthy food and healthy ways of life. So, um, so yeah, absolutely brilliant. So, um, yeah, that's, that's very, very interesting. So, so what, what could you say that, that we, we could all do to become a little bit more conscious um, in, in what we, in terms of a conscious consumer? So you were saying that we should all learn and grow with it. Have you got any tips along those lines of things we can all start doing? I do. I, the simple thing to do is that every family needs a farmer. And I think when you know your farmer, that's probably one of the best ways. And that's really actually a huge trend where um, farmers are wanting to sell direct um, because it's a way that they can pocket more money. Um, and they need to do that because um, like, three, I think it's three fifths or four fifths of farmers in the UK are not profitable without subsidy. And that's, that's not a good thing that our farmers are actually not able to make money without a subsidy. Okay. So um, we need to make relationships with local farmers, 
ask them questions, find out what they're doing, visit them on their open days. And then when we find a farmer that we trust, then we need to support them. And um, that's true for vegetables, it's true for meat, dairy, all that. And the more that we do that, um, it's better for our health, better for the farms. We'll see every, every pound that we spend is either supporting a, a practice that's degrading land or it's a supporting a practice that's regenerating land. And don't we want to all regenerate land? We, we want, you know, a friend of ours um, in Arizona, I love what he said. He said, the reason that he cares about regenerating our earth is because he wants to reincarnate on a thriving planet. He doesn't want to reincarnate on a degraded planet. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you've got, are there some like examples of some good work that's happening at the moment to, to regenerate soil and, and things like that? Yes, absolutely. Um, holistic management is um, a framework for decision making that farmers can use where they're learning how to make better quality decisions. Um, and then they're able to regenerate the land. And one of the best things that people can do is to watch a simple TED talk by Alan Savory. And I'm just going to ask uh, my Christopher to please get that TED talk. Um, and put that into chat so people could have that. And, you know, in 20 minutes, you learn a whole lot. And um, one of the really simple things that people can do is, you know, maybe let's say once a week. What if, if everybody once a week were to buy um, meat and dairy from a farmer who's growing that animal on pasture rather than in a feedlot. That would make a massive, massive difference. And we tend to think we don't have um, feedlots in Europe, but we actually do. And uh, they're just kind of hidden away and we don't see them. And so that, that would be one super simple thing that people could do. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, like uh, one of the things you were saying as well is that perhaps just a smaller number of people are, are needed to create a kind of a tipping point to help make this collective change. So are there some like examples of, of, of that or do you know what the, those limits are so we can all help to make that um, collective change? Yeah, um, you know Malcolm Gladwell, he wrote the book um, Tipping Point and you know, what he talked about um, is that there are all these tipping points, right? As you go up the curve, um, there's countless, each, each time the slope of the curve changes in the adoption curve of something, that's a tipping point essentially. And um, when we look at veganism, veganism is experiencing countless little tipping points right now. And people think they're doing it for the right reasons. And I'm just gonna give you a couple of statistics about it. One thing is there's 12,000 restaurants in London right now offering vegan friendly options. That's huge, mm. that is huge. And then there's 388% um, growth in vegan takeaway orders between 2016 and 2018 in London. So we know that's, that's a huge trend and we know we can hear from this, people want to make a difference and they understand that what they eat matters. People are really getting it. Unfortunately, they don't have very good information um, because I think a lot of people, the reason they're going vegan is because of climate change. The trouble is that the food that people that manufacturers are selling to vegans is creating climate change oh. because of how it's grown. Um, and so we, ne we need to be better informed about 
uh, what to do it, to have a climate change responsible diet and, and also be good for our health at the same time. So by and large, um, people that when they're making that transition to veganism, very often they're doing it in a convenient way and then not um, a way that is looking at the fact that they need to get a lot of nutrition in a new way. They're going to have to learn how to eat vegetables, for example, and they're going to need to learn how to cook beans. Um, and they're going to need to eat beans all the time because that's how they're going to get their protein. And most people that transition to veganism don't do that. And instead they're eating like the worst junk food you can possibly imagine and how it's grown is, is degrading soil. And so it's not healthy food to begin with. Um, so th these people are getting sick, quite frankly. And what happens is they reach a certain point and they find out that they're sick, quite ill, and they end up going back to meat, but they go to healthy meat. Um, they, they want to eat really healthy meat. So they go to companies like the Ethical Butcher or Primal Meats, um, and they get healthy meat that's been grown on, on really good grass um, and has been raised with high animal welfare and all these things that are going to make a good, a good diet and actually mitigate climate change. Interesting, interesting, because uh, yes, fascinating what happens with some of our some of our food. I uh, a couple of years well, in um, when we could meet up in real life and things. It could have even been a potentialization. To, in fact, I think it was potentialization back when we were at Rise. Um, there was somebody there, and he was talking about food and the journey some of it took, and um, even like some salmon that's caught off of. Uh, the coast of Scotland or something then goes on a ship all the way over to China to be um, sliced and stored and everything else and then comes back and even um, lettuce, uh, a, a bag of lettuce, if you buy a bag of salad, you know, it's got loads of nitrogen put in and its carbon footprint isn't particularly friendly either. Um, so it's, it's fascinating that even even things like vegetables that you think actually you know you're doing well they've still got their carbon footprint and like you're saying with how the soil is used um, in farming and how it can get degraded and how we need to reinvigorate that soil to produce healthy crops etc so important for everybody to consider so um so yeah so uh brilliant well thank you very much uh, any any other points that you would like to say on 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 the healthy soil, how it creates healthy food for healthy people. Yeah, I'm going to tell you about um, a, th a factoid that pe pe very few people know. And that is that livestock actually maintain pastures. And um, without livestock, it's very, it's very impossible really to maintain pastures. But, and there's many reasons why we need to maintain pastures well, but there's a climate change reason why we need to maintain pastures. So when the pasture is healthy, um, it's photosynthesizing. And when it's photosynthesizing, it's transpiring water vapor. So water vapor goes into the atmosphere and this water vapor interacts with solar energy and it creates hydroxyl ions. And hydroxyl ions are the pollutant cleaner uppers of our planet. And they eat up methane. Um, and they eat up not just methane from the livestock, but they're going to eat up methane from all the things that we humans are doing to emit methane like gas leaks and fracking and, and our own human methane. And livestock emit one one hundredth of the methane photooxidation services that they provide to planet Earth. So I think this is such an important fact for people to understand. And probably the most important message is 
we need to be better at discerning and and not just take everything that comes at us through the mainstream media as fact. So the message that's really strongly coming through in British media today is eat less meat because meat is the enemy, right? It's causing mm -hmm. climate change. And that is true for um, meat that is raised indoors on grain. That is true. Um, but it is not true for pasture reared meat where the pasture is well maintained. Those livestock are doing the reverse. They are uh, climate change mitigators and they're essential because we can't have pasture without them. So we, we've got to be more discerning in how we take in information. Yeah, absolutely fascinating that. Um, I'd never heard that about that like eco cycle, if you like, regarding um, livestock and being essential there. Because, yeah, I, I've always just heard that, um, like you were just saying as well, um, meat is causing the, the problem with climate. But then um, but then sometimes maybe the media does want a story. I always remember ages ago now as well, we were told to buy diesel cars. Um, and I actually bought a diesel car <laughs> and then I was told don't buy diesel cars I'm like what am I going to do with my car now I thought I was doing the right thing um, you know so um, yeah it's very interesting that very interesting but you can easily you can easily see it that if you're letting things take their own natural cycle as it was intended i.e you know meat uh, or animals on pasture and le letting nature take its course if that makes sense rather than you know humans overusing things for profit etc that um that you could see that it is a very responsible ecosystem etc because that, that's nature basically isn't it yeah yeah it is um i just heard a really exciting story today um one of our uh, people in our class, um, he's working with an important um, site in Scotland. And what they're going to do is remove all the fences from this farm. And then they're going to put these um, no fence collars on the sheep and the cattle so that um, they're basically steered by this collar. And um, the consequence of not having fences then is that wildlife can move so much easier. Um, and so it's a, like a rewilding farming project all in one uh, thing. And I just think that that really captures my imagination. And I, I want to see more wildlife. Why? Because I know it's possible. Um, and, and we can regenerate wildlife quickly um, when, we, when we want to. And we, we've got good examples of that around the world. And, you know, just thinking back to your, your fish story, the salmon going to China. Well, why are they getting salmon from here in the first place is because their, their fish stocks are low in Asia. And we know that when we're managing holistically, we can regenerate the world's oceans. We can regenerate fish stocks. And it actually wouldn't be hard. It would be quite easy. We just have to have the will to do it. Yeah. And we have to be able to shape policy that would allow that to happen. And within 10 years, I believe if, if you did it well, you could really have plentiful fish on planet Earth once again, because the oceans are a place that regenerate quickly, but you have to put in place the right policies and then, of course, enforce the policies, make the policies appealing so people want to follow them. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it might be slightly different, but, but the examples that I've seen are um, you know, like the coral reefs and all of these kind of things that are degrading and stuff. And wouldn't it be wonderful if 
you know, this can all be regenerated back to its natural habitat. And then that, that's a win-win for everybody then, because we get the best food and, um, you know, healthy lifestyles, etc. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for the talk. If we, uh, shall I open up for uh, questions? Have we got any questions coming in, John? Darren's already asked a question. Uh, yeah. was, Sheila, was, you were talking about it takes a long time to make soil. How long does it take? Uh, how, do, how is soil made? Okay, good question. So pedogenesis is the word for soil making. And nature, you know, originally soil making was hard and took millennia. Um, and it was really um, when life first came up onto the earth, from, it came from the oceans. And these really tiny little things, um, algae and lichen and moss, through very slow process, break down rock. Uh, to make soil and and that takes thousands of years a very slow process now today that we have soil soil is made in a, an entirely different way nature has a different way and this is through photosynthesis and it's complex it's quite complex but you know hey i get to draw now don't i a picture is worth a thousand words let's draw it's way more fun okay so here's my, my soil surface, and here's my plant. And this plant is photosynthesizing, and it's got uh, nice uh, roots coming down. And so what's happening, this plant, the plants are an interesting thing because they're the only living thing on earth that make food. Everything else gets our, we get our food ultimately from plants. And so through this photosynthesis, they're drawing down and they're producing what we call liquid carbon. And roughly, just roughly a third of the liquid carbon is, is used to grow biomass on, on top of the surface of the soil. The, you know, the leaves, the stems, the trunk, whatever of the plant. Roughly one third is used to grow the root structure. And then just roughly one third is, is fed out of the roots um, as exudates, okay? It's literally squirted out. And what's it feeding? It's feeding soil biology. And we've got a lot of soil biology um, in the soil and all this biology, basically they're animals and they can't make their own food either like us. And so they're dependent on the plants to photosynthesize. Meanwhile, the plants themselves cannot mine the soil. They can't take rock and just get the minerals and they need all the minerals just like we do. So the soil biology, they're kind of the miners in the soil. And um, they're literally mining and they're able actually to produce minerals as well. And they're able to exchange literally. Um, what they're doing is they're solubilizing this. And then the, um, this, um, there's a process in the soil where this liquid carbon is becoming glomalin. And glomalin is what becomes long-term carbon. And this carbon can stay in the soil for hundreds or thousands of years. And this is how we pre re really grow soil, is by drawing down carbon from the atmosphere into the soil. And so I'm gonna draw another picture that helps make this idea maybe just a little bit more clear. So let's say, let's say that's a picture of rock. And then this, the same rock, then what that looks like when it's soil is those mineral particles spread apart. And what's spreading them apart is, 
is carbon, okay? And carbon is the sponge in the soil, and it, it opens up these, these particles. And it's, it's creating um, space for air and water. And every one gram of uh, water, sorry, every one gram of carbon is going to hold 10 grams of water, okay? So when our soils are shedding water, a, a lot of the reason for that is because the carbon has already been mined out of the soil through um, poor agricultural practice. And so our, our um, agricultural practice is taking this spongy soil and turning it back sort of into rock. And so this is how we grow soil uh, um, today, how we grow soil. Pedogenesis happens through simply growing green plants on soil. It actually grows soil when you do that, when you do it well, is the simple answer to the question. Wonderful. Yeah. We've got, Darren's actually put another comment in, which I think is really fascinating. And he's talking about when you were paying the farmers to make a profit. But it's actually really interesting for me because something I realized a little while ago through talking to Sheila is self-employed people. If you're a company, all the staff get paid and then there's some profit left. But if you're self-employed, you tend to think when I've paid all my expenses, I've got some profit, but it's actually what they need to live in, to live on. Uh, does that make sense? Do you want to add more to that, Sheila? Um, I'm not really sure. What, are you asking a question about... Sorry, the question that Darren asked is that why are we paying farmers a, a profit so that they've actually got a profit as opposed to just uh, breaking even? But I think it is fascinating that actually when we're self-employed, we think of profit as the money that we live on as opposed to what's left. It's a good question. I, I got it now. Thank you for clarifying. So I'm not U European and I don't know the background. And if Monique or Christopher know, I'd love for you to actually just jump in. But historically, um, farmers have been paid subsidy in Europe to, um, to grow food. And um, I believe, did that start after World War II? Do you, does anybody know when that practice started of paying farmers and why? Because that's a piece of history that I don't know that I wish I knew. Christopher, do you know, or Monique? I'm wondering, <laughs> is it to do with the European common agricultural policy, all that kind of stuff that gets a very bad name sometimes? Uh, yeah, but I, I don't know why it was other than I know after World War II, there were food shortages that, that I know. And I'm imagining that out of those food shortages, then they developed some kind of a payment scheme that um, rewarded farmers for producing more. But that's pure conjecture. I honestly don't know why this started. Um, now, the consequence of it though, is it's been going on for such a long time that the farming sector has become dependent on subsidy. That's, that's the problem that we have today. And um, so this dependency, I think, now I don't mean to be insulting for farmers who are listening, but I think it's led to laziness in the sector. And laziness in thinking, laziness in approach, because if your sector, if your entire sector is getting massive subsidies, why would you try to be more efficient? Why would you try to do anything new? Um, and so I'm, I'll tell you an honest story. My, uh, our, my daughter-in-law is married to someone who grew up um, on a wealthy farm in England. And I asked him one day, uh, George, how did your mom and dad get so wealthy as farmers? And he said, oh, it's very easy. 
we lived on good land that allowed us to grow anything we wanted. And every uh, spring, my, my father would read, what are, the, what are the richest subsidies being paid on? And whatever that was, that's what he grew. As it, that was a, it was a done deal. The government basically decided what he grew. And that's how he got really wealthy. And he lives in Bermuda or something like that. You know, he doesn't need to farm anymore. Well, that's what our taxpayer money is going to, is crazy stuff like that. Mm. Well, if there's anybody else problems... Sorry, go on. So one of the problems I had, Lord Heseltine was lobbying to stay in the EU. And one of the reasons for that is because he's got a lot of land and he was getting bunged a few hundred thousand a year by the common agricultural policy and all that other stuff that we just mentioned for the land. He was doing nothing with the land. They, would, they just get subsidies and he wanted to maintain his subsidies and that influenced his political decisions. And that's why I asked the question, why do we give them money to make a profit? They shouldn't be making profit on government subsidies. They should be breaking even at best. Yeah. You know, otherwise, they're just not viable. Point. Yeah. Can I come in here? Yes, please, Mike. <laughs> no, you're, you're you sorry. Got some <laughs> wisdom here. Oh, uh, I hope so. No, not really. No, your story was quite accurate, actually, about the starting of the subsidies. But I know here in, I I don't think it's a good system. Any. Anyway. Uh, because what you said, people are getting lazy, their creativity is gone, and no one thinks about other uh, opportunities or possibilities. But I know uh, the farmers here, we're living in the Ariège, it's quite sort of the poorest region in France, and the farmers are actually living off the subsidies and nothing else. They, they don't make any profit of it, actually. I know some farmers who are, are paying to... <laughs> to to uh they well they don't earn anything and uh, i don't again it's not a good system so yeah when you're on a healthy wealthy land and you can keep the land and you make the profit of it then then it's certain that's possible but it's also a system where where farmers are are totally dependent of now and that's so it, it really should change and uh, mm -hmm. yeah but it's not all farmers are healthy and making a good uh, living and, and profit of, of the subsidies Mo mostly it's it's on the edge because the uh, the what do you call them not the produce no the uh, how do you call them? the people you so, so the supermarkets and things like that they 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 pay on the edge too so they don't really make a profit so it's it's more complicated than we pay taxes and well, all the subsidies go to the farmers and then it's actually the farmers who really want to do the right thing and uh, keeping it a bit small, what's quite popular here and, and local, well, they have a hard time <laughs> making a living of it. So that's not a good thing also. So, yeah, but I, I agree the the, 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 the uh, how do you call it? The creativity should be, uh, activated <laughs> creativity is always good always good um julie have you got a question i think you need to come off of uh, mute so i thought you had control of the mute for some oh, reason uh, <laughs> um there are organic farmers and they're getting more um, in Great Britain. We buy from a company called Abel and Cole and they support um, organic farmers of, of all kinds, of dairy and um, vegetables and um, uh, beef, animals, all of those. So I, 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 that makes me feel optimistic. I've been supporting them for years. Um, it really does taste brilliant. It really, really does uh, taste good and, and, and does you good. Um, so I think I just didn't want to say you know, if, if all the farmers are in the old mode. They're not. There are people who are breaking the mold, and are um, you know they, they they give you little articles about how they're improving the soil and and this kind of thing. So there are people out there trying to work on this, and um, it help. We we as consumers can support that by supporting them. 
I'm so glad you support Abel and Cole. Uh, we love Abel and Cole. I agree, their food is delicious. Yeah, you can taste the difference, can't you? Yeah. Cool, wonderful. Yeah, I try and shop at uh, low places where things are locally sourced, and actually, well, I think it is as well. It's like uh, so. We've in Chalton in Manchester, we got um, Unicorn, which is a cooperative um, uh, grocers, and it's locally sourced food, which is really good. And whenever you shop there, you can always taste the difference in good quality food, which is cool. Um, so, uh, has anybody else got any other questions for Sheila? on healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. I'm wondering, does organic farming actually regenerate the land? Or it's obviously better than non-organic, but is it regenerative? It's a good question. And the answer is it depends on the farmer. <laughs> so why, why does it depend on the farmer? Is The answer is that organic practice is quite prescriptive and um, it's basically a minimum bar and um, it's, an, it's an exercise where they're trying to prove that you're not doing something. And that is they're trying to prove that you're not using harmful chemicals, right? And so that's kind of a hard thing to do, number one. Um, it's, it requires quite some bureaucratic exercise to do that. And so it's kind of a negative. It's looking at it, what you're not doing, rather than what are you doing? <laughs> and um, so... What does this mean? It means it depends on the worldview of the organic farmer as to whether or not they are regenerating soil. And, it, and so what do I mean by that? Well, it depends on what's the underlying motivation of that farmer. And so some farmers who are managing organically, their ultimate reason for doing it is because they'll make more money, more profit. So there's profit seeking. And this farmer typically is just doing the bare minimum. And if you do the bare minimum, you're actually degrading soil uh, because there's nothing prescribed in that organic that would actually regenerate soil. And in fact, I'll just give you one example. One of the things that's common in organic is they want you to have low stock density and low stock density of livestock is not what you want. Um, that's going to actually degrade land. So um, what um, the farmer who is organic that is regenerating land the reason they're doing it is like for human health, planetary health, animal health, plant health. You know, they've got that big picture in mind and they're going way beyond the organic standard. They're educating themselves. They're learning about soil. They're learning how to take good care of soil. And they're, they're doing all the things that, they, that should be done. And they're good farmers and yeah, we need to buy from them. Yeah. But unfortunately, just having the organic label doesn't guarantee that they're regenerating soil. Yeah. I, I know it's not a pure guarantee, but, we, but what I find with Abel and Cole is they'll give us stories about their farmers and the stories of their milk farmers. Um, uh, and, and they put it on their bottle as well, that they, they milk their ladies in the morning and then their whole of the afternoon is on the pasture and it's on proper pasture doing all the good stuff that you say has, has evolved they've evolved it's going back to how things were when they were evolving and I th so I think there might be some people who are cynically just going to the standards but I think a lot of people are going into it for the fact that they care about this stuff and um, I, th <coughs> I think it's Keith Abel tells the story that he used to work in the city and he left the city and um, he started selling bags of potatoes. And this guy said to him, do you want me to show you what they put in those potatoes? And he showed them all these bags of poison. And he said, oh my God, 
And that was when he began to work to try to be a, a provider of, of more organic food. It's not perfect yet, but there's definitely some people who are going way beyond the minimum legal definition. Yeah, yeah. It'd be all very interesting as well because um, not, not knowing what's under the cover, if you like, if I go to the supermarket and I buy something that's organic, I think or it's gonna it's all the same thing, but it seems like there's a almost like a hierarchy of how much they're putting in within that that you're not necessarily aware of as, as a consumer unless you do your own research, which comes back to your points earlier. So yeah, yeah, really fascinating. I did some quick calculations. It 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 doesn't take, you know, a lot of people to make change happen. And if just half percent, just half a percent of UK population were to start buying uh, meat that's really grown on regenerating soil, that would be 7 million chickens, 430,000 turkeys, 83,000 pigs, and 33,000 steers. That's a lot of livestock. Wow. That's, it's really tremendous. And it really, it's just a half a percent of people caring would make a massive difference. And then once those people start enjoying the quality of life from those wonderful animals, and they tell their friends, and they tell their friends, and they tell their friends, you know, it, it just grows nicely and easily. And the farmers need that kind of support. And um, farmers will change when the consumer changes. That's what I believe. Absolutely. What a, what, a, what a wonderful sentiment to, to finish on. So uh, that's absolutely brilliant. Cool. So um, unless we've got um, one other quick question, I think uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you, Phil. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. Very, very inspiring. And uh, you've certainly inspired me to uh, really look into the food that I'm buying for, for, to improve my healthy lifestyle and hope I look half as good as you when I'm 59. So <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, thank, thank you very much for the interview. Um, thank you, John, for, for, for supporting and doing all the work in the background and the questions. And thank you, audience, as well, for participating and all your questions. Um, so this this will be um, uploaded to YouTube if anybody wants to uh, watch or share later and all of our previous uh, potentialization talks are also on YouTube as well um, and uh, we'll be back next week um, for another discussion so thank you very much everyone take care see you